So it's 10 o'clock and I will call the meeting to order. The chair notes there's a quorum present and we'll do the Brexit. Aye. Aye. Okay, 2.0 additions and revisions to the agenda. Do you have anything? Okay. Move into 3.0 correspondence and public comment. We'll start with public comment. Individuals wishing to address the county court may do so at this time and at other times throughout the meeting. Speakers are asked to raise your hands, be recognized by the chair, give your name and address, and limit comments to three minutes. Do you have any public comment? See any? We're going to move on to correspondence. I just have two things. Um, both are emails from Les Ruark. Um, and I will just go ahead and um, add these to uh, the record because one of them in particular is pretty lengthy. Um, the first one has to do with the county's compensation board and some um, suggestions that Mr. Rourke is making in terms of how maybe it could be structured differently, um, asking us to consider um, making appointments earlier and these kinds of things. Um, and then the second one has to do with 6.5, the salary schedules. Um, regarding the COLA increases and staff increases for the county, um, county court. So for folks who are watching at home or anybody that wants to read those, those will be online and then they'll also be part of the official record for the meeting. So in support there are consent agenda. Okay, I move to accept the consent agenda. Second. Been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda, which consists of consider approval of June 10th uh, special meeting minutes, consider approval of June 17th regular meeting minutes, consider approval of June bills pending review, consider approval of intergovernmental agreement for development and support of the property assessment and taxation search web application with Lane County, consider approval of ODOT um, 5310 grant agreement number. 34250 and consider approval of intergovernmental agreement for medical examiner services with the River County. Is there further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Okay, we'll go into unfinished business. 5.1 Consider award at fiscal year 2020 2021 special project plans. And let me just catch up a little bit on. Okay, so the um, the special projects grant review team met and reviewed applications on um, Thursday, June 11, and they have submitted their recommendations to us for review. Um, as a reminder for folks who are in the audience, there's a north and a south um, fund for these, so we'll be looking at North End and South End applications and making funding decisions um, out of those two, two African pools. Do you guys want to start with North or South? Let's start with North. Oh, okay. a bit. Um, I was in agreement with the um, committee um, on all the four that they recommended we fund, which was the Ironton Lions Club, the Arlington Saddle Club, the North Hill and the House District, and the Game East on Day Watershed Council. Okay. The Arlington Education Foundation. I want to do some more. I tried to reach out yesterday, but I wasn't able to get a hold of um, Brad Anderson. I had a lot of questions okay. about. Um, I know we have funded them in the past, mm -hmm. the past four years since their inception in 2016. And um, every uh, in their grant, every year it said that they were using the money for the same thing, which um, to me really wasn't a special grant because it was for actual operating expenses, mm -hmm. not a special project. So that was one of my questions. That and also, um, didn't see what the actual structure was. 
And I wasn't sure why we were using so many outside consulting firms and design teams. And so I just had a lot of questions before I say absolutely no or no to any funding at all. Okay. So. so are you thinking it's something that we would potentially move forward on the other four? Yes. And then maybe revisit this one. Yes. I'd okay. like to, to get some more information and, and continue to, to look at this. What do you think of that approach, Leslie? Well, um, I didn't have any issues with the four that were um, recommended that we fund fully. Um, but I had some questions on the, the Arlington Education Foundation, too. I was part of it, I could see it looked like it was, might be an operating. Mm -hmm. um, grant cycle as well. And then the other part I could see maybe where it could fall under a, a special project. Um, but, so one of the questions I had is, did we, everybody that's applied for special project grants in the past, were we very clear with them that if it is an operating grant, you need to apply in the previous cycle? I think so. I think sometimes the people are a little unclear about what that looks like. So for for example, we we have historically, I think last year for the chamber, funded their website out of a special projects grant. So it was a one-time deal. And so sometimes we treat those things separately. Um, so I could definitely see, for instance, the portion of here that would go towards the website development as being something that because we allowed it last year, consumption was that it would be acceptable under this this right, application I, I too um, but i do think some of the things that are probably a little um are, are in a little gray areas when we get into like the grants um the grant writers kind of thing because um and so that may be something we need to go back and talk to them i mean a lot of grant um agreements with grant writers can be structured so that they're taking a portion actually out of the grant itself and not out of, mm -hmm. um, so they may need to look at a different structure instead of having the county fund the grant writer that that money would come out of the grant that they actually um, acquire from the grant writer. Mm -hmm. What did you think about the newsletter design portion? Did you see that that, I mean, I think, would that be included in it as a special project or? If they were anticipating that that was like a one-time thing, and then perhaps you could count it as a one-time project. Um, so, but but it sounds though that we may need to get some clarity from Brad on if that is their intent, and maybe have a discussion with him about so that we're clear on what things should be under um, operational, what things should really fit better under special projects. And we always, every year, try to encourage folks to call Kelly way ahead of time so that she can try to steer them into the right funding pool. So this is just a reminder for folks who are um, looking for next year's grants that Kelly is a fantastic resource. So people should feel free to call her anytime and she can help steer them into the right um, thing. So, I mean, I'm thinking um, it sounds like um, and, and the other thing is we can't really release these funds anyway until usually August 1st when Ellen closes the other the books. So I'm not sure that this would set them back a great deal because most of those checks are not going to come out until August. Okay. So we could bring this particular one back on the 22nd and when we meet again, if you guys wanted to do some follow-up with Brad in the meantime and kind of and ask some of those questions. Um, does that sound workable? Yes. Okay, do we have a motion for the other four then? Probably. <laughs> or I can make it if you know this one. Um, I move to award fiscal year 2020 2021 North Gillum special project grants to the following organizations um, Arlington Lions Club in the amount of $4,400, Arlington Saddle Club in the amount of $16,125, North Gillum Health District in the amount of $12,000, Gillum East John Day Watershed Council in the amount of $7,500. And authorize the county judge 
to prepare and execute grant agreements reflecting the terms and conditions discussed. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we award fiscal year 2020 2021 North Gillen Special Projects grants to the following organizations the Arlington Lions Club for $4,400, Arlington Saddle Club, Unana of $16,125, North Gillen County Health District in the amount of $12,000, and Gillen East John Day Watership Council in the amount of $7,500 to authorize the county judge to prepare and execute grant agreements reflecting the terms and conditions discussed. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, so we will um, I'll have Teresa just make a note that we'll bring back the Arlington Education Foundation um, on the next agenda. So we can get that one wrapped up. And then we need these. That's a paper to shuffle. Okay, how about we go into the south, um, the south applications. I mean, I think all of these, the recommendation is that everybody was um, funded their request except for the child care's number two project. Yes. And so are we in agreement about Let's do, let's do the ones they're saying to fund first. Are we in agreement with all of those? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so that would be for folks who are watching at home. That's the city of Condon, Condon School District for the pool. The Condon Child Care had a playground um, upgrade that they needed to do. So they needed to fix some stuff. Condon Scholarship Foundation for um, their annual fundraiser. Um, Dinner, assuming that they'll, they're able to have that. <laughs> uh, Kind of baseball for um, some maintenance needs on their fields. Um, East, Gillum East, John Day Watershed Council. This is split actually between North and South, but this has to do with that sand table and some other things they're going to do to be able to do some conservation education in the school district. Um, the cemetery district for um, some binders they're going to be putting together. Um, for burial information. And then um, Summit Springs Village, I'm trying to remember what was in that one. What all they had asked for in that. Landscaping and signage. Landscaping and signage, yeah. Um, so if we're, we're in agreement with all of those ones. Okay, let's talk about the one that was recommended to, to not fund, which is the second priority project for the child care. What were your thoughts on that one? Well, I was, um, you know, you brought up in a previous meeting that, um, that they were missing out on some state funding because they weren't charging enough. And it sounds like this would allow them to um, get to that level. So I was wondering what you, I was kind of wondering what you, you thought about it. I also, you know, I'm concerned, I'm a little concerned about them. It, you know, cause you also mentioned the last time that they are at the full capacity. And there's still um, they're requiring a lot of assistance. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was kind of I was kind of yeah. So what you thought on. to give a little bit a little bit to kind of fill that in is what this project would be. They're calling it a tuition for talks, um, and the idea would be that. The state, the state reimburses them up to a certain amount of money um, per child um, for, um, for lower income working um, families that qualify. But the state's reimbursement is set based on what the actual tuition rate is. And so because they're below what that reimbursement rate is, they're leaving several hundred dollars on the table per each qualifying child. And so one of the things we talked to them about is, I mean, obviously they have a concern that there are a lot of parents that are sort of in the middle, that if they raise rates to, to the state's reimbursement level, it, that may make it unaffordable for some families to be able to afford the service. And so one of the things we've been talking about is could they do a scholarship program so that on paper, their rates are at a certain rate, and then for families who sort of fell in the crack, they would be able to offer scholarships for those particular kids so that families wouldn't, um, one, they wouldn't be leaving state money on the table, 
and then more importantly that families wouldn't be sort of priced out of um, having the service so i think this is their effort to do that um i i the one the thing that gives me pause about it is um again spending the money on on a marketing consultant yeah, yeah. so i'm i would be in support of the portions of their requests that are actually for the event um yeah i can't help but think that there's got to be someone out there that has the capacity to help them put their event together that would be a volunteer so that they can spend five thousand more on a consultant yeah, yeah. So my, what I was thinking when it's I read good, it, it's a good event. I think I can say no for the entire thing. Yeah. yeah, and it looks like out of the they're requesting uh, eight thousand one hundred and fifty, five thousand of that would go to the marketing consultant, mm -hmm. and so I was kind of leaning towards granting the the difference, the three thousand one hundred and fifty, um, so that they could, and that would cover the cost of them actually putting on the event, the rentals and um, paying for dinner and, you know, it's similar to what we do for um, the Education yeah. Foundation, where we help cover the cost so that it's all, all profit for them. Yeah. Um, so that their donations aren't going to expenses. Exactly. Going to the that was my actual fund. That was my feeling on it. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good alternative. I, I think it's a, it's a good project. I just don't see that five thousand dollars for someone to help them put the event together. That's how I felt too. Does that sound? What do you think, Leslie? Yeah, it sounds. Um, I think that's reasonable. It, so these marketing type requests, they really should be coming more in on the operating too. We want. You ask for money for marketing efforts that should come in on the operating grant? Probably. Um, but I think, I mean, for me, I'm a little leery of spending a lot of money on a marketing consultant to come in. Um, because I think you hire somebody from, say, the Portland area, marketing to Portland does not work at all. And the issue is not for the childcare that they have a lack of kids showing up. I mean, they just, that's not their issue. Their issue is they, the, the money doesn't work on the revenue side, so they need to figure out some ways to fundraise. Um, so I, I'm just not sure that that in particular is gonna get them where they actually wanna be. I agree. Okay, we got a motion for the south one. It'll be a long one. Mm -hmm. Okay, the um, <laughs> I move to award fiscal year 2020-2021 South Guild special project grants for the following org organizations. If I could talk, uh, City of Condon Condon School District eighteen thousand three hundred dollars. Condon Child Care, number one project priority, eight thousand one hundred twenty-five dollars. Condon Child Care, number two project priority, three thousand one hundred fifty dollars. Condon Scholarship Foundation, three thousand five hundred. Condon Youth Baseball, two thousand six hundred. Gillum East John Day Watershed Council, seventy-five hundred. South Gillum County Cemetery District, one thousand seven hundred fifty. And Summit Springs Village Corporation, eighteen thousand. $35 and to authorize the county judge to prepare and execute grant agreements reflecting the terms and conditions of the staff. So moved and seconded that we award fiscal year 2020 2021 South Gillum Special Projects grants to the following organizations City of Condon, Condon School District, 18,300, Condon Child Care Priority One Project, 8,125. Condon Child Care Priority 2 Project, 3,150. Condon Scholarship Foundation, 3,500. Condon Youth Baseball, 2,600. East, uh, Gillum East John Day Watershed Council, 7,500. South Gillum County Cemetery District, 1,750. Summit Springs Village, $18,035, and to authorize the county judge to prepare and execute grant agreements reflecting the terms and conditions discussed. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
motion carries. Okay, I, I, I did have one other comment. Um, you know, I appreciate all the work that, that everyone that was on the committee did in putting these together. Um, definitely, you guys did a great job. I do sometimes I look at this information, especially when it's on spreadsheet. In, in the past, it's been kind of nice to have like a going back a few years, you know, what if they've been awarded grants over the last few years and what the amounts were. Mm -hmm. So, if there's a way that we could incorporate that information on it. I think now that we've got a couple, these would have been really dramatically skewed because, yeah, because they used to use this for um, operational, and so it would have looked like people were getting huge amounts before where now we have something to compare. Exactly. So, but this will next year will be the third year, so I think we'd have good comparison data then from year to year. Okay. Yes. Yes. And so we will get those grant agreements out um, for everybody that we decided today, and then we'll bring back the that last remaining one and get that one wrapped up. Um, for 5.2 billing codes update, um, I had a conversation. All over here um, with the city of Boardman and state building codes actually came to Condon, um, which was great. And I think we have um, the beginnings of an agreement between the three of us. So there were some sticky points about whether the state would allow us to um, split building codes because the city of Boardman does not have an electrical inspector on staff. And so the state would, had dug in their hills and said, you can't split them. It all has to go to one or the other. And um, so I um, CC'd the governor's office in my response back to the state, and they seem to have found a path forward. So um, <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Nate Stice is on. Um, he was part of that um, and of pushing them to reconsider that. And so what it's looking like right now is that it would be an agreement between the three entities. Um, the city of Boardman would do um, everything basically but the commercial electrical inspection. That would be the state to do. Um, we probably, we're still working out it. State law appears that we need to have somebody within the county boundary accepting those permits. And so we had discussed about um, most people, I think, do those electronically these days anyway. And so those can go directly to the building inspector in Boardman. But for those who maybe have handwritten drawings or things like that and, and don't feel comfortable doing it electronically, we would probably just look at having a drop off be at the planning department. And when the building inspector comes through on his rounds, he would just pick those up um, from her. Um, the, what what we the other thing that came up that is a little bit different than when we initially talked um which i didn't think this would be a big deal for us was that originally the city of Boardman had offered to send us a portion of the fees like 25 percent of the fees that came off those permits the state is saying that's not allowed under state law that they all need to go to whoever's providing the inspection services which i did not think would be a big deal for us um, so basically, the state would keep all the electrical inspection fees, city board would keep all the other fees related to it. Um, they did not anticipate they would be charging us more for travel or anything like that. They thought it would be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. I also asked them if they thought they would need part of the macaw reserves to make that solvent for them. If they needed us to transfer it over to the city of Boardman and maybe put it in the account. They, they felt with the activity that happens at the um, Port of Morrow, that they are very solvent and they did not need our funds to be able to keep their inspectors employed. So, um, so what do we end up needing? Yeah, yeah. The, what do we do with the state somebody? suggested we hold on to it in case something changes down the road and we needed to look at a different partnership or if something changed in the city of uh, Fordman down the road, found that they weren't having as much volume and needed us to help supplement it. So we're able and if you guys remember during the budget um, discussion, we set up a separate fund that it's being tracked through. And so we'll just roll that over year after year without really touching it um, until it's needed. 
down the road. So it'll just sit there and, apply, and uh, accrue interest until such time as it would be needed. Um, and so uh, the state has said that they would like to get this done as soon as possible and that they're hopeful that this would be sort of a model they could hold up for other municipalities. Um, particularly they're concerned about with um, not knowing how long this recession we're in is going to last. They said last time they had this, they had a lot of building departments schools because they didn't have the volume to support um, inspectors on staff. And so they're hoping that if we can set up a good model, they may be able to use this in other parts of the state as ways to keep people sustainable so the state doesn't have to take on um, so the state was going to take the first cut at the IGA agreement. They were going to go look for something that they could model. And then, um, so I'm hoping in the next couple of months, we'll see a draft come back from their attorneys. And then, of course, we'll run it through our legal counsel and city board men will have to sign off on it as well. But we are definitely moving forward, and it sounds like we have a path forward to work with the city of Boardman. Um, he did, service always comes up, and so obviously I want to be cautious about setting expectations for our construction people in the room, <laughs> Jeff. Um, but he thought, at least at the north end, um, based on their schedule, that we're talking probably two to three days a week that we would have service. From the so, um, which would be great, I think, right. for yeah, people well, to have yeah, that kind of um, yeah. activity. The north end, I think, or the south end, I think he would try to combine if you know if he was coming out for an inspection and he knew a homeowner was going to be filing the next week that they might try to combine so he's not running out to Lone Rock um, two days a week from Gordon but um, anyway it's moving forward so um, I'll keep you guys posted once I once we get dressed up Next one, uh, move into the new business, which is 6.1, discuss ADA and safety upgrades to Gillum County Courthouse. So um, this is just kind of a, something I'm throwing out here is what I'd like to work on the next building project. Um, Oregon Department of Motor Vehicles, as you guys know, is downstairs, has raised some concerns that there isn't an ADA accessible bathroom on the first floor. That was one of the reasons they had basically told us they thought they would be leaving the courthouse. Um, they have not done that. Um, but I'm thinking not only would it be nice to kind of resolve that with them, but I think also just for future courts, it would be nice since we have funds sufficient to do these kinds of projects that we just take care of updating the bathrooms all five of them in the building. Um, the fifth one is back here. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I read that at home and I thought, I've only known really three. Have so, <laughs> I know. Or, yeah, men's and women's on top and bottom, and then the jury room. Right? Yeah. Um, that we go ahead and upgrade those. Yeah, I'm um, surprised we haven't been kept with doing that previously. Anyway. Yeah. And I think it's probably only a matter of time yeah, before so somebody. That you know, before the state says they need to all be upgraded. Right. So, um, if that helps us resolve two things at once and makes DMV feel happy where they're at, um, then that would resolve that issue with them. Um, and then, what that may require us to do, and Jeff and I will kind of look around the building, is the downstairs, there's that little nook in between um, the two bathrooms where the there's the coffee machine all that kind of stuff because the doors need to be wider um that would likely have to go so that that whole thing would disappear and so we'll, we'll be on the hunt to try to figure out a potential break room gary has a evidence room that he was going to maybe look at reshuffling some things we may look at that as a potential option um, so we'll kind of be problem solving on that and then there's also um while we have uh, contractors in the office, I'd also like to take out the pocket doors in the county court offices and replace them with solid wood doors that are lockable um, for security and also just for sound proofing because there are some sensitive conversations about personnel that happen in those offices 
be nice to just kind of improve that. And then the final piece of that, and Gary's here too, um, he can maybe shed some light on this, but I don't, because there's really not a, because the parking lot on the back is at um, window level, if we have people who either accidentally or intentionally um, drive from the back, they drive right into the sheriff's office or into Chris Patno's office, any of the offices that are on the parking lot side. Um, and so we've also talked to Jeff about maybe putting some barriers up that are attractive so people don't really realize they're barriers, but then that would prevent people from potentially driving into those offices. That would include the north end of the courthouse as well. Yeah. Off, off the lawn. So, um, based on that, I asked Jeff just to put together uh, an initial proposal for us to take a look at. Jeff, did I miss anything? I covered it all. And I wanted to see if this was something we're interested in doing. The vehicle barriers is definitely something that came up in the safety committee as well, and that's something that they are interested in pursuing. Um, most of these would be covered under, um, would just be paid for under our capital um, improvements fund. Um, the, the vehicle barriers thing, there might be some support security funds that we could put toward it. And that would, would that be kind of its own separate project? The, or is this all Are you thinking two separate contractors or? Yeah, I don't know. It kind of depends on how the timing works out for it. You know, when it would be done, what the scope of work is. It could be two contracts, it could be one. But I think the core security portion it could be, you could argue it, it may well be less than the $50,000 threshold for the bowling project, depending on the prevailing wage, depending on what we end up doing for that, what the scope of work is. Um, I think the ADA upgrades will almost certainly be over $50,000, so that's going to be prevailing wage. Thoughts or questions? So the revised entry doors to county administrative offices. Is that downstairs? Is that the way you were just going? Yes. Down? So that would be the the pocket door between Lisa's and my office. And then um, switching out right now there's French doors between Teresa's right. and mine. That would just be a single door. So a lot of noise comes in between those. Worse, so I didn't know if there was others that needed revising. Uh, the break room situation I think would be nice for people that don't live in Condon and don't get to go home for lunch. There really is a lot at this point, is there? No lunch. No. Currently, the uh, jury room is used as a break room at lunch, but the second room would be nice. And there may be some other little odds and ends that, that we may talk to Jeff about tacking on. So for instance, there's a security door right behind Gary that um, blocks off the hallway when the justice or when the circuit court judges are in. The issue is Teddy's office is behind it. And so, and she doesn't, she pops it open so she can access it, which kind of defeats the purpose of having the security door. So we talked to the circuit court about moving that further down the hallway so that you could you can access Teddy's office without having to go through the security door and then the security door will still block off the public from where the circuit court judge is uh, is sitting. So we may we may add on some little things like that um, as well. I just kind of wanted to at least get this before you and see if this is the direction if I'm on track that this is something we want to tackle. Yeah, I, I again, I'm surprised that we haven't been asked to upgrade our, our bathroom previously. So I think you know, getting ahead of the game before this mandated would be. Yeah. Thoughts, Leslie? Yeah, it looks like a plan. I mean, I think we need to move forward and see what it takes. So I would move to approve the professional services agreement with 
Solar Consulting Group in the amount of $39,860 for design and project management services for ADA accessibility and safety upgrades at the courthouse. And I second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the professional services agreement with Solar Consulting Group in the amount of $39,860 for design and project management services for ADA accessibility and safety upgrades at the courthouse. Is there further discussion? Judge, can I comment just a little bit? Yeah. Um, I, for several years, I've been trying to get this portion of the building upgraded and made safer uh, for not only circuit court, but justice court, um, law enforcement providing security during court or jury members, all of those types of things. And that would pretty much take everything from this hallway that direction and completely redo. So I just want to keep that kind of out there, um, that if we're going to spend money on that bathroom, that maybe that would be part of the plan of changing or moving. I can't really do that. But anyway, just to keep that. But there may be other Fine, projects that go with This is up. really an unsafe area during our uh, court days, yeah. which are far and few between, but I would like improvements up here eventually. Yeah, we have been kicking around the idea, and I think this is maybe like phase two, is maybe saying about moving the, the judge's bench over into that corner, and maybe saying if the risers that the, um, that the jury sits on could be maybe portable, so that there's a little bit more flexibility so that we're we I mean we use a lot of room for the jury sort of area where we don't really have a lot of jury trials. Um, so having some flexibility in terms of how we're able to use the room. Um, there's also an issue when we have dependency cases and mom and dad and DHS are all in here and sometimes mom and dad are not seeing eye to eye and they're right next to each other, or often the defendant is sitting right next to the jury during a jury trial. So there's there's quite a few issues with how the room's set up. Um, so we had talked about um, maybe having eventually the, um, the design firm that did Sherman County's new justice wing and did their courtrooms to look at this setup and see if there's some things that we could do that would um, increase security and then also give us a little bit more flexibility for setting up so that we can try to keep parties who are at odds with each other in the courtroom a little bit separate and make sure there's good exits for I would like to see an exit out this place so that you know, some, because once you're in here, I'm going to have a claustrophobia anxiety which I'm talking about it, but I feel trapped yeah. because, because there's inside. no way to get out if somebody came in this door and to assault us all, there's no place for it. Your secure areas are out in these halls. Yeah. You can't get out of this courtroom. You can escape out. So the idea is to keep the threat in here. Yeah. And so that's how it's designed. But the judge. And those doors are locked and you can't open them. I couldn't figure out. You couldn't get this door open. Yeah, they're going to be designed. You can't open that door. Designed yeah. for a court and not. For this case. court, yeah. So yeah, the doors need to be left open in a public setting, but in a court setting, they need to be closed and locked. Yeah. So anyway, that'll be sort of a phase two, I think. But we definitely, it's on my radar as um, sort of a next phase project to look at it. Sorry to interrupt you, but no, no you're okay. good. Okay. So the motion was to approve the professional services agreement with Pillar Consulting. The amount of $39,860 for design and project management services for ADA accessibility and safety upgrades at the courthouse. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay, let's move into 6.2. Chris. So this is discussed fair board office window replacement and received chairman updates. You can just sit wherever you like. I'm over here. <laughs> Take a the corner. I know that. Look at the corner. <laughs> I'm six feet from her, so. so six feet from Donna. So in your packet, there is, there's two things I think we want to talk about today. One are upgrading the windows at the fair office. 
um, they need replaced. They're old and leaky, and then one of them, one of our lawn mowers, when we were up there, threw a walk through one of them. So that one needs to be replaced as well. And so the fair board um, sent us bids. They're, since they're under the five thousand dollar thresholds, they don't have to. We don't have to have three. Um, and one is for materials of two thousand one hundred and eighty-one, and then the installation of four thousand one hundred from Cooper Construction. It would come out of the capital projects fund um, as well, which is fund two thirty which has, I think, almost a million dollars in it right now that would be available. So we have plenty of funds. Did I miss anything on that, Chris? I don't think so. And that's just the history that, you know, Gillen County owns the buildings up there, and it's just been in the past that um, any maintenance on the buildings themselves has been covered by the capital improvement projects or whatever line item it is. So this is something that we haven't actually come in a couple of years to you guys to request anything. We have actually done quite a bit of our own maintenance, um, low-key maintenance and stuff like that in the past couple of years, but we're getting to the point of now we're um, getting into some more expensive stuff and um, including, and I, I'm not sure how long it'll be before we have to replace that we did what we can on the beef farm with the, all the holes in it and we have somebody try to you know fill in some of those holes but there's still quite a few of them up there so if we have any more windstorms like we're getting lately it's going to be um not if but when so and, uh, yeah free maintenance not yes <laughs> yes <laughs> yes um just to, and uh, I just wanted to throw in a little bit, just a little bit of report for you because it's just kind of nice for you guys to know what's going on. Um, but we have, um, in the last two years, I kind of went through the last two years of our fiscal statements, and we have actually done over $27,000 worth of projects in the last two years of the program. We've um, put in a brand new pig wash rack last year. Um, we've updated our um, arena announcer booth with windows and stairs and everything with it. Yeah, just the little one, not the big one. Oh. Um, installed cement in our pig barn. I mean, we've got to the point of where we had more pigs and we had stalls, so we had to add a bunch of cement down the middle aisle to, to make up room for that. Uh, purchased new picnic tables, which are wonderful, nice, uh, fold down flat. Um, updated the sound system in the bee barn. We just recently bought brand new pig boards and we got turkey cages up the wazoo now. We've got turkeys, so <laughs> if you want a turkey, come to the auction and buy a turkey. Um, we installed a new sprinkler system this year in the grass area between the office and the grandstands and then under the big tree. We did not install anything in the house area because we really don't know what we're doing over there yet. So we didn't want to get stuff put in there that's not going to be needed down the road. And we just um, remodeled the storage room in the office, which was a huge endeavor. We, what I would consider was the master suite on the end of that office. Um, Jay came in and he ripped out walls, ripped out bathroom, walk-in I mean, ripped out everything, and then um, made it into one big room. And we had all new wiring put in, all new lights put in, and now it's just one big storage room. We have shelves up, um, both uh, up and down both sides of the room. It's, it's a wonderful setup now. So, so we just got done doing that, and um, that's our projects. Um, we just currently hired Nori Wright. She's our new fair board secretary, and because of all the other jobs she has, we're open to the public on Wednesdays from one to five. Um, bless her heart, she's, she's, yeah, this is a really bad year to become a fair board secretary. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we just really don't know what, what we're doing. I hate to say that, but um, we've had the attitude that we're moving forward. We're going to have a fair, and that's just the way that we have done for the last couple of months. Um, and then we got thrown a wrench that 4-H was not going to, uh, the state 4-H office at one time said, sorry, we're, we, 4-H isn't um, going to be able to participate, they thought. And actually, 4-H clubs at this time have been shut down. They haven't been, be, haven't been able to meet through this last three or four months. Well, then the state 4-H office came back here a couple weeks ago and said, well, we're going to start looking at this county by county. So we may let you go ahead and compete or participate, but um, there's going to be a lot of state guidance that the 4-H um, are going to have to abide by and everything. Of course, that was before this mandatory mask uh, requirement went into this week, so there's a lot of stuff we're going to have to look at next week. 
the Fair Booking will Wednesday. Um, I will say that we have actually, you know, we've already gotten all of our signage done looking at fair. We're um, looking at getting the hand sanitizer stations. We have contacted our maintenance people who said that they would clean the restrooms, you know, um, twice a day like was required. And we had all that stuff taken care of before the full master department came out. So um, we're just not sure what we're going to do. I can say wholeheartedly, and Gary's on the fair board as well, that there will be a livestock show and an auction no matter what. We are going to make it work for those kids. Um, uh, there may not be fair at all as far as the exhibit halls or, you know, I, I just don't see how we can allow or not allow, but make our superintendents be in there wearing masks all day long in those, in those barns in those, um, hallways. So, you know, we'll, it's just something we'll have to talk about next week. Um, and that's about fair. <laughs> so the other thing is too, is we're still, some of the other projects that we're looking at moving forward to is, um, Painting the food booths, the outside of the food booths in the museum and the arena office all need to be repainted. There, the museum, I'm not sure, it's stucco siding and it's falling off. And so that's going to be um, more than just a paint job. Not sure what we're going to do with that yet. And again, like I said, lots of maintenance to be done in the future, like the roofs and everything like that for the different barns and stuff. So we're just trying to make it work and moving on. So. That's one day at a time. What's that? <laughs> one day at a time. I know, and I, yeah, and it is. I, I wasn't really losing sleep over this stuff until this was the weekend. I was like, oh, crap, now this is just, yeah. So if we can, we can make it work somehow for those poor kids that all have their animals and stuff like that. So as long as we can find judges that are willing to come up and judge for a day to get the confirmation stuff done. So, but the Weaver County Council theirs, they're, they're moving forward with the livestock show of some sort. Morrow County is doing the same thing. Umatilla County is doing the same thing. Us in Sherman County said, no, we're going to have a fair. We're going to move on. Um, I haven't talked to anybody in Sherman County to see what their attitudes are now, um, <laughs> what, what direction they're going to move forward. Wasco County had already canceled theirs. Um, so, yeah, we'll just have to wait and see. And I, I really, really do think that we need to make a decision within this next two weeks of what we're doing because it's only fair to um, our food vendors and people like that that would be coming in. We want to get get it nipped in the butt before they start ordering anything. So yeah. So yeah, that's where we're at. Do you want to add anything? The only thing is is a complete replumbing of the oh, yeah. of the food barn. That yeah. hopefully will get done before fair Yeah. Questions for Chris? Um are you guys okay on the window replacement? Project. I get a motion from you guys for him to. We thought it was time to replace them when Robinson Brothers was in there in the snow. What's uh, your Teresa would come to work in the morning and there'd be snow piled on her desk. But oh, okay. <laughs> so we thought maybe it was time. <laughs> yeah, the building's been there for a while. What's that? That, that building has been there yeah. for. Well, I've been on the board 16 years yeah. and it's been there since before it's that. No need. Yeah. It was, yeah. 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 From, actually, from Bristol. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, John, you know, <laughs> I moved to accept the material bid of $2,181.60 from Arlington Hardware and the installation bid from Cooper Construction for $4,100 for the window replacement project at the Golden County Fair Office. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the material bid of $2,181.60. From Arlington Hardware and the installation bid from Cooper Construction for $4,100 for the window replacement project at the Gillen County Fair Office. Is there further discussion? So, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Okay. You got your windows. Thank you. Okay. All right. Let's move on to 6.3 Re Governor's Regional Solutions Update. I'm just looking. Hey, Nate. Hey, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so Nate has got a bunch of state folks on. I don't know, Nate, if you want to let us know who's a, if everybody's planning on talking or if you're planning on talking. What's the plan? I think I'm, I'm primarily planning on talking. I just uh, wanted to, um, you know, let you all know that regional solutions. When we come out, we bring all of our friends with us. So, um, but really, um, the primary purpose of this is just to check in. So. I'll, 
I'll quickly, um, why, why don't, it, uh, Judge, if you're okay with it, why don't we, would you mind if we just let people introduce themselves and then I'll, I'll say yeah. three things and then ask you a bunch of questions, so. That would be great. Okay, so just um, uh, for everyone, I'm uh, Nate Stice. I'm the North Central Regional Solutions Coordinator out of Governor Kate Brown's office. Uh, you know, we work on community and economic development in normal times, and in these unusual times, we've worked a lot on helping with economic and public health response. Um, uh, and so the, you know, the tagline for Regional Solutions is where the governor's uh, coordinated uh, approach to community and economic development. We um, we coordinate state agency efforts to sort of help help communities move projects forward and so um we invited a few members of the eastern team which is the team that shares your county to uh to come and sit in and listen and uh, maybe add a bit if appropriate uh, and so why don't we do introductions why don't we start with the dlcd folks Um, I'll start. My name is Tamara Mabbitt, and I'm your Eastern Region Rep. So Gillum County is part of the 10 county uh, region that I work with, along with the 59 cities in there. And um, in my previous life, I was a county planning director in Umatilla and in Morrow County, so I know Michelle pretty well. So, And since I started with DLCD in December, Michelle and I have had several conversations about all kinds of things, so she has a full plate, so always enjoy working with Michelle. Hi there, I'm Lee McElvain. I'm Tamara's colleague at DLCD. I'm the economic development specialist there. Uh, I joined the team just a couple months ago, um, so uh, very happy to be participating and learning today. Thanks. Hi, my name is Ryan DeGroft. I am the uh, Regional Development Officer for Business Oregon, covering Gillum County. I've had, uh, I'm pretty new in my position. I started in February. I've had a lot of really good conversations with uh, Lisa Atkin and also with uh, uh, Kaylin at the Condon Chamber as Business Oregon rolls out various programs to uh, respond to the coronavirus pandemic. But really looking forward to uh, a time in the future when uh, we can get back on the road and come down and, and meet uh, the rest of the folks in the county and, and uh, get on with non-COVID business, right? Amen. Sounds great. <laughs> Amen. Um, well, so um, I, I think uh, Lisa asked me to cover um, sort of a one-on-one on regional solutions. Lisa, is there more you think um, that, that you'd like for me on that front? I don't think so, Nate. Um, okay. I just wanted to make sure that commissioners had a good foundation before you kind of project off into your questions for them. Yeah. I didn't know it was going to be a quiz, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean a quiz, but really, so, I mean, the, the bottom line of regional solutions, and I think Business Oregon and DLCD and the other agencies on the team are DEQ, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, DSL, the Department of State Lands, the Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Parks and Recreation participates. Uh, who am I missing, guys? Um, uh, and, and whoever we want to bring along, Travel Oregon, is, is we, we really want to work with you to support your community and economic development priorities. Um, and, and so, you know, to Ryan's point, um, we've been working a lot on, on the COVID response and that really have appreciated Lisa and Kaylin's participation in the Mid-Columbia Economic Resilience Team and also um, the judges and others' participations in the Bi-State Recreational Insights Group that's been really thinking about travel and our recreational assets and public lands in, in this crisis. But man, I really want to get back to, at least business has a little bit unusual, and that's really my intention of going county by county and, uh, and, and chatting with, with the commissioners to really see like, what, what do you want us to be working on? And I, I've got some hunches. Now, now, that, now that we have a few more minutes and there's other folks on the team here who, have, who still have a few more minutes and can help carry some balls down the field, right? Um, even as, um, even as you know, business Oregon and regional solutions are really, you know, deployed on COVID response. You know, what, what are those, what are those three things that you would like our attention on? Um, before, 
to give you a second to think about those, let me give you the, the three updates um, on COVID um, uh, and then two updates on other things. So um, the, the Mid-Columbia Economics Re Resilience Team next week will be doing a training on Tuesday from 9 to uh, 9 to 10.30. Kaylin will be launching an, an announcement later from the chamber really focused on two things. One is uh, very troubling, the other is hopefully going to help with one. The, the first is we're seeing more and more work, workplace outbreaks. Um, and and, and I, the way that I've been hearing public health officials talk about it is we should just expect workplaces to have outbreaks. So really starting to get our, our places of business thinking about what happens when you have an employee get COVID or God forbid you have an outbreak that reaches the level of, I think five is the number for an outbreak, right? So we'll have Mimi McDonald um, as one of the key presenters, a couple other public health folks and talk through that issue. And then the other one is um, really talking about the science and understanding the rules around the new uh, statewide face covering um, uh, guidance um, to help, really to help the business community think about like what their approach and rights are and, um, uh, uh, and how, they, how they talk to customers with this new requirement. And, and the two are very intimately linked, right? The one is helping to prevent the other in my mind, or maybe the better way to put it is slow the other um, to give people time to prepare. So that's one piece. I think I gave my second really piece in there, which is today is the day that the new mandatory face covering uh, uh, guidance goes into effect. Um, then the other pieces that I just wanted to say, I've, I've got eyes on to help you think about what other pieces are, or um, Ryan or Tamara have eyes on are really um, housing. I've, I've checked in a little bit with uh, the city of Condon around, um, around the project there for housing. Um, uh, would be curious if, if there's anything else there. Tamara is really the point for, um, for the EOA. And I, I think I understand that it's been adopted in Condon but there's some projects there that I think we want to talk about a little bit more. Uh, Ryan, I think, has been talking to folks about infrastructure projects a little bit. Ryan, am I getting that right? Always happy to have those conversations, but I'm not aware of any pending projects in Gillen County right now. And, and then the other piece that I've just sort of been checking in on as we think down the field, COVID or not COVID, is industrial land development and, and, and what what continued pressure on land markets mean for, for your industrial sites? Um, so I think those are the items on my list. And, and I just wanted to, to say, you know, we're here and ask you, you know, what, what three things should the, really the Eastern team with my help from North Central be thinking about from a community and economic development perspective? So there's your pop quiz, sorry, Judge. There's a pop quote. Well, I think you you've hit on the, the big ones that the communities identified. Catherine's Catherine Reiner from the city's in the room as well about their housing projects, but I think that's definitely um, for the south and in particular something the city is taking the lead on, which we would obviously try to be supportive of in any way we can, and obviously any way that you guys can. I know Catherine's identified the need for some technical assistance. Um, around ways that they can ensure that the property they're acquiring from the school district is utilized in the way that they hope that it, it be utilized. Um, so that's definitely an ongoing need for us, I think, is, uh, is that technical expertise. In terms of um, the infrastructure side, I mean, we've been discussing it here, and I think, um, I think COVID has made this even more apparent that the digital divide that we experience living in rural Oregon has real ramifications, particularly in a worldwide pandemic where people are being asked to work and learn and stay at home. And so I think we keep running into it, needing money to help make those investments. I think we have the right partners at the table who are interested in it. Um, Lori Anderson's here from the co-op board as well. So, I mean, we've got, and the city has been really active in it in the county. So I think Gillen County has definitely, our communities and our partners have been really focused on fiber for years now. Um, but the thing we keep running into is, it's, as you know, very expensive to get fiber to people who live outside of the city limits. 
and that continues to be a stumbling block in order for us to be able to deploy, you know, fiber, basically. And so, and we keep running into this. I know it's mostly a, a federal funding issue and the way they structure those. And every time I'm on the phone with one of our federal delegation, it comes up. Um, but I think, you know, if the state is looking at ways that they can help encourage that investment, help the community prepare for a second wave, those kinds of things. I mean, we definitely, at this point, I think we're still waiting anxiously to see what's going to happen with our schools this fall. I know a lot of parents would prefer not to be homeschooling, but it would sure make it easier on them if it, they at least had internet access yeah. um, to do it. So yeah. those kinds of things, I think, are the big, at least for me, what do you guys think? Yeah, I think the rural fiber issue is, is huge for us right now. I know um, families that have two working uh, parents and two kids trying to go to school, and it's virtually impossible to do all of that in the um, scope that they have for service. So it's a big issue for our families. Yeah, and it, for us, it's mostly funding. You know, I think we've got we've got some people who've been around the table now for a lot of years and kind of understand now how the system needs to look and who the partners are on the table is. But I mean, when Columbia Basin has run the numbers, it's a multi multi million dollar investment that we're looking at. And although the county is very blessed with the resources that we have from windmills and from, it's not enough to to do what we're talking about. This this would require partnership from the state and federal um, yeah. entities to actually bring the types of dollars that we would need to do this correctly. Yeah. Well, and, and just on that point, and I, I wanna hear from others, but um, I, 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 you, you know that um, in, in this household, we've been preaching the gospel about rural broadband for years, probably mostly my spouse, Carrie Pippinich. Um, but I, I think um, uh, uh, I, I think some hearts have been changed on that front at the state, and I hope you're all, all you're all tracking that um, the legislature did in the special session pass the universal service fund amendment that I think um, would provide about five million per biennium, specifically targeted at two things: technical assistance and really project design. But I think the bigger thing is, you know, they really want to put some infrastructure in the ground. Again, uh, you know, Lori being in the room, and we all know that those projects are really expensive, and that means that the the federal leveraging federal is the real the real key there. And uh, uh, Ryan, do you want to talk a little bit about the special broadband money that you got out the door? Did you get out the door? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mean, the eboard in early June allocated $10 million for broadband projects. Um, that allocation came out of the Federal CARES Act money. So unfortunately, that comes with some federal uh, restrictions that include having to get that spent by the end of the calendar year. Uh, anybody who is familiar with broadband projects knows that, that not only are they expensive, but they're time consuming to design and plan. So what that really means is that most of those dollars are more than likely going to go to uh, projects that have been in the works for some time now and may be uh, at or close to uh, being ready uh, for construction. Um, one of the caveats there, and I had a great conversation with Lisa about this a couple of weeks ago, is that there is uh, also eligibility for uh, and I'm, I'm not going to get the terminology right, but for <clears throat> emergent needs to bring uh, broadband service to K-12 education and telehealth. And some of the ideas that we've seen around that is deployment of uh, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots uh, that might be strategically deployed around a community to provide um, a signal to uh, neighborhoods or homes that may need to, uh, for example, um, provide a signal for, for kids to stay home and do distance learning. Now, we all understand that in um, real rural areas that might cover a couple of neighborhoods, but we've got a lot of folks who live outside of town. And, uh, you know, that challenge is one that's um, 
probably not going to get met by that kind of solution, but it's uh, it's one way that we can at least ease the burden a little bit, I think. I'd also mention that um, Business Oregon is uh, working on um, a portfolio of concepts that we are going to take to EDA to try to get uh, some EDA money into the state uh, to work on uh, several different projects that really kind of align with what Business Oregon traditionally does, but that will include a fairly sizable ask for broadband projects as well. Um, that will likely not include construction dollars. It's probably going to be more technical assistance uh, dollars only because um, the, the construction obstacles and, and hoops that need to be jumped through with federal money are pretty significant and probably best handled on the local level. But <clears throat> uh, the $10 million, uh, although it's got a short spend, if we end up with uh, some of this EDA money, that will uh, be able to go uh, a lot farther to help communities um, get at least uh, planned and prepared for uh, applications for federal asks, I think. Thanks. Um, so, um, so there are some things moving on the broadband front in ways that they, they hadn't moved before. I think, Judge, to your point, really, people are seeing the needs for education and health in a way and telecommuting in a way that uh, we, we never have before. So, um, so I, I know you all have a broadband working group. Um, if, if, if there's a route for virtual participation, I'm certain that um, whenever you need Ryan or I, that Ryan, I'm speaking for you, sorry, man, but that we'd, 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 we'd be there to, to provide anything we can. So and okay. I bet you Tamara would show up as well. <laughs> questions or other thoughts things you want to convey to the team priorities that or people in the audience to have some thoughts that they'd like the governor's team to focus on well i think you covered i think you covered the big ones i did have a quick question about when is this training you mentioned a couple trainings um but i didn't get when they're going to be occurring the one on workplace outbreaks and understanding the Covering. Yeah, so it's going to be one training. So the so I, I think probably many of you participated in the business adaptation training that the economic resilience team um, put on. Oh man, <laughs> a long time ago now. <laughs> it seems like years ago, around phase one, and um, and so we've been working on sort of what what phase two or what I'm trying to rename as the continuity phase. Uh, what training for that looks like and so this is this is going to be the launch of that right with two topics that I think are really timely and, and it's going to be done as one training uh, on on the 7th so next Tuesday from 9 to 10 30 and Kaylin you'll be seeing that that launch from the chamber probably later today with the link for for registration on zoom and so it'll be both the face coverings and the workplace outbreaks you know, we're thinking about some other other areas of conversation. We're thinking about um, best practices and, and, and workplace high impact environments, innovations people are seeing. This is based on some conversations around ag operations. We're like, you know, we think we need our workers in masks, but holy hell, K-95s don't hold up very well, right? So what do you what do you do in that context when, you know, the one of the, the pair packing houses, one of the phrases they said is like, our, our workers run a marathon every day, right? And so how, how do we protect them? What are some innovations and best practices coming out of manufacturing and other sort of high impact work environments? We're, we're gonna lean into, and you know, I don't know when we're gonna do this one, really thinking about how, how we're making sure that businesses, workers have access to all of the suite of benefits that are out there right now to, to care for people broadly We'll get a little bit into that on the workplace outbreak training, but there's some other ones around like rent assistance and pieces that we, we think that businesses might be like a good conduit to make sure the public is aware of, of the broad suite of resources. And, and we're, you know, we're soliciting input from the full economic team and would welcome your input on what, what other needs or conversations are needed around how we, how we keep businesses in our economy functioning even as we see the virus spike, right? And that's like the context that um, 
keeps me up at night is uh, on, a, on a Hood River emergency operations call. I heard um, uh, on Monday that the state is expecting cases to go from, I think we're clocking about a 200 a day to 900 by the end of July. So, you know, doubling down on thinking about how we're protecting people across the economy is, is on my mind. And, and that's where we want to, we want to prepare people to mitigate the impact as much as possible. Sorry for going down that no. path. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that if, that if you look in our courtroom, everybody except for the three of us sitting up here, four of us sitting up here have masks on and part of yeah. the discussion, I know this is hard, hard for the community to grasp why when we're in a county that has zero cases, why we need to go through this, these precautions. But I think we just have to remind folks the alternative here is if we do have outbreaks that we're looking at having to close everything down again. And I'm not sure some of our businesses would survive that. So, you know, if each of us can take personal responsibility to keep ourselves and the people around us um, healthy, then that will go a long ways to keeping our businesses, our economy, sort of the fabric of our community healthy. And it's going to be up, up to us to make sure that happens. So, um, anyway. And I will just say, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nate. I was just going to say, I, I have to say that because of the actions of, of the court in the community mm -hmm. in Dillon County, I, 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 I think I've said this to other folks, I think you guys are going to come out um, ahead on this, you guys are gonna, you know, the, the quick action you took to support your businesses, I think was just inspiring and inspired action in other places across the region and the state. So. More questions, any comments from the, from the crowd for him? <laughs> it's your chance to talk directly to the governor's office. <laughs> Anybody's got anything? They're all silent, Nate. So I think we don't have anything for, more for you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, Appreciate the time. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you for team. having us. Yeah, mm -hmm. great to see, see you guys. <laughs> thank you. All right. So should we move on to 6.4, which is discuss Burns Park Historical Society Land Survey. So this, um, and we've got a bunch of them sitting here, but I'll give you guys sort of the overview and then if the Historical Society, if you guys can miss anything, you can jump in and add. Um, so if you guys remember, I mean, obviously the um, Historical Society butts up to our Burns Park and um, Fairgrounds property. And then if you remember last year, we, um, through our special project, helped fund, they're looking at putting in a new exhibit um, hall up on the property. And so as they were going through the planning process with the city, um, there was a question that came up about the property line on the east side. It's a little unclear where that is. And before they put a new building in, we just need to make sure where, where that actually is. And so that sort of led to a discussion between the city and Jeff and the Historical Society and me and the assessor's office actually about maybe looking as well at the property line between the north side property line, which would be ours, and um, between ours and the, histor the historical society, about getting that surveyed and possibly looking at adjusting the property line. Currently, they have a lease with us. Um, I think it was signed in the 80s. And so we had sort of kicked around the idea of if we did this, if we did a survey for the entire area, that would help them resolve their issue. Um, with the city over planning and getting the building where it needs to be. Um, Hammers is the private property that, that is on the east side. Um, so I think Hammers would be willing to move that line as well and um, to make it work for the historical society. And then on our um, joint property line, we would do the survey and then potentially get that moved if needed so that, um, so that then they would just own that property outright instead of having a funky lease that's 30 plus years old um, that is sitting in a file someplace. Um, and so what I was looking at, I mean, normally we would send, if it was just for one entity and their benefit, we would normally send this through a grant process. But given that it would have a direct benefit to the county in terms of getting that property line defined for us, 
and cleaned up, Chet confirmed that that would be helpful in his office um, to have those property lines sort of surveyed and identified appropriately. Um, that I'm thinking that it's enough of a county benefit that I am recommending that we just go ahead and pay for it um, outright. Um, so yeah, it would allow us to clarify where the north boundary of the property is, if needed, um, then to also do property line adjustments on both the east side for the historical society and the north side between um, the two of us. And um, we, I've not talked to the surveyor for sure about what the total cost would be. I think when he was just looking at the east side, he mm -hmm. thought it would be about $3,000. Um, and so I'm thinking if you add in the north as well, you're probably looking at probably five to $6,000 for that whole project together. Did I miss anything? Did I cover it? Oh, the only thing I can add to this the map that we were referring to was show that we own to the west into Almond and into the Sears property. It's just not on the east side. Okay. If you, I mean, if you're looking at the same map. Yeah. I don't know which map you're referring to here. That, that's the only addition. Go ahead. Uh, we also found that we don't have an easement on the Highway 19 through the County Health Park. Yeah, Jeff had, Jeff had raised that with me as well because I think he's working with you guys on the building. And so one of the things I talked to Henry about is looking into, because you've been granted access for so long, Jeff was wondering if there isn't something that's grandfathered in where we wouldn't have to go through that whole process. And so before we went down the path of having to get legal documents drawn up, we were going to look in and see if that um, is is the case. In which case, it may just be you guys are grandfathered in. It's a public entity that's allowed the access. So, um, so he did he did raise that, but that's good for the court to know as well that that may be something else we need to look at is just guaranteeing that they would have access to their property um, long term. But I don't think. I mean, in terms of the two, I think we can move ahead with this one and sort out the, do the research on the easement side. Um, and, and that can be a second, um, second thing if we need to actually go back and get that all documented. Questions about this? I don't have any questions. Do you, Commissioner Lerner? I did not. I was like, yeah, the first thing, yeah. I move to approve funding a land survey of the Burns Park Fairgrounds Annual County Historical Society property boundaries and contours. And then second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve funding a land survey of the Burns Park Fairgrounds and Gillen County Historical Society property boundaries and contents. Is there further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Okay, I am, um, Jeff and I will be following up with the surveyor then, and we'll get moving on it. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. of course. All right, we are almost through. Let's go into 6.5, which is consider approval of resolution number R2020-21, adopting the fiscal year 2020-2021 salary schedules. Um, before we start, we have housekeeping on this one. Um, which is that I need to declare a conflict of interest, actually all three of us need to, um, because one, it has to do with um, my own salary, but as well, um, my dad is the lead master, as you're all aware, and so this also sets his salary. So I need to just declare a conflict on that. Okay, and I will declare a conflict as it is my salary, and it's also my son's salary as the assessor. And I will declare a conflict that it is my salary. <laughs> and so the guidance from the Ethics Commission, when we have multiple commissioners that have um, a conflict that, so that we're not, if, if all of us were conflicted out, we would lose the quorum, um, is that in this case, since we've all declared it on the record and all three of our votes are needed in order to have a quorum, um, that we can go ahead and proceed with discussion and voting. So. Um, now that that is through, 
Um, just as background for folks who are not familiar with this, every year the county court is responsible for adopting the salary schedules. And um, we do those for represented employees, which are our um, union represented employees, our non-represented employees, the sheriff's office employees, and then the elected officials for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, the collective bargaining agreement, the current one requires that we provide our represented employees with an annual cost of living increase. That is based on a calculation that's set in the, in the actual agreement. Nathan does runs those numbers um, every year um, to do the calculation, and this year it's calculated at 2.5%. Um, and then historically, what we've done is adopted a cost of living increase that mirrors that amount for everybody across the board. So we just go with whatever the, whatever the represented employees um, are getting based on their contract. Um, we extend that to our non-represented and, um, and our sheriff's office. And then for elected officials, that process goes to the compensation board. And so the compensation board met earlier this year um, and provided, there's a letter in here from the chairman, uh, Wally Powell, that basically their recommendations were um, not to make any adjustments uh, to the previous schedule in terms of um, the sort of baselines, that the elected officials should receive the same 2.5% cost of living increase and that um, they should receive the step changes following the current schedule. Um, at, that are appropriate for time served. So all of our folks are on step schedules, depending on their um, longevity here, the number of years served. And so after so many years, they move up into schedules and those are automatic things that were baked into the CBA with the, the collective bargaining agreement with our union employees. Quick question, the, sure. so the compensation board, they only deal with the electives? They only look at the electives. They are tasked with, um, in essence, making sure that the elected's compensation is comparable to what other electeds throughout the state are getting. So they, when Nathan, Nathan staffs, provides the staffing for them. And so when they meet, he typically is sharing with them. AOC tends to collect um, data from all of the counties about what all of the elected officials are making across the state. That information is then shared with them. And then they make recommendations to the county board about any adjustments they think are appropriate. So this year, they're not making any recommendations other than just the standard COLA increase and steps um, that were sort of baked in already to that, that system. Um, and then the other thing that you'll notice, so, um, so everything in here follows those contractual obligations and recommendations in the attached um, salary schedules. Um, I've also noted the places, for instance, um, are the public, our um, public transportation director that we, um, right. that position we created, that's now a non-represented position. So all of those have been adjusted. All the decisions the court's made in the past year regarding personnel, those are all captured in here in terms of, um, in terms of which schedule they're represented on. And then um, Lisa also did a check because we are subject, Oregon has a pay equity law that means we need to make sure that we're paying um, like positions at like rates and, and need to make sure that you know protected classes in particular are not being paid a, a lower rate. And so she's, she's gone through all of these to make sure that those are in compliance with the pay equity law. Um, the other thing that will look significantly different from last year, you'll notice, is that these all fit nicely on eight and a half by 11 page um, uh, papers. And what's significant about that is the auditors um, have suggested to us that these salary schedules, rather than being focused on individual employees, need to focus on positions. Um, and so that's to simplify, it's also to make sure that we don't have any errors. And then their other point is those things such as step increases, um, COLA, um, all, all of those kinds of things um, are already baked into our agreements. And so it's not, the county doesn't have, the county court does not have um, jurisdiction to not provide those. We've already agreed to them contractually with the union. And so their view is that that's an administrative function that between Ellen and Nathan and I, we make sure that those are accurate. And then Kelly's, Kelly's the new union president, by the way. 
So Kelly double checks those to make sure that those are in, you know, that the union signs off on their employees in particular to make sure that the steps were um, credited appropriately based on time served. So um, they just suggested that those administrative things be done administratively and that the court focus on the high level position um, classification in them. So that's why they're so simple to share. Well, it, it just makes more sense because um, we don't know that an individual is going to still be in that position in two months. Well, having right. people's names against those salary, salary steps to me never makes sense anyway. I have never seen anything like that. Yeah, when we have retirees, First we have time. people who move on, new hires, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it does. Um, and and it is definitely in the error. The errors where we have them are definitely in trying to calculate for each individual person and their steps and things like that. So this is simpler for the court. Um, for every day. Any questions about this or and this this um, any requirement we have for what we are what we are approving, what we have to approve and keep <laughs> Exactly. Um, the legal our new legal counsel this year actually said Unlike previously, where we signed the actual things, he said this actually needs to be done through a resolution of the court. And it makes some sense, actually, because this will permanently be attached to that resolution. And then Ellen has a resolutions file that she keeps every resolution. So all of these will be on file. So we will never again have a situation which we've had previously where court members didn't sign uh, the salary schedules and then when the auditors go to look cannot find the actual documentation this way it's um it'll be permanently in the resolution book um, so that we can easily find those documents i'd like to comment on behalf of the union um, one concern that the union members have is that um, with all of the information left off the salary schedules and for mpe and the steps that people are in and their hire dates we would request that the um, selling schedule is attached to the um, bargaining agreement mm -hmm. actually is the full schedule with the employees and their steps and signed off on by the court and uh, our representative from that. Which we can do that. So basically what we would do is if you guys approve this um, today, I'll take that and plug that in. And then there'll just be a signature page, basically, where the three of us would sign that. And then that becomes a, the final addendum uh, since it's the end of the, the last year of the three year contract that then would be attached. And that would include the individuals um, that are in there and all of their all of their steps. But for the official court record that goes into the resolution, it would be the simplified version. So that will free you by this. Question? Well, I was, I was concerned a little bit at, at first because I was wondering if we had convinced, you know, too much because I'm used to, but I'm just used to seeing um, all that information, but. Yeah, because the FTEs, um, the FTEs are actually set when we do the job descriptions. So when we tinker with those, that's where we tinker with them. Um, and then the steps themselves were already established. They're established in here, so it's an administrative actually moving them from place to place, basically. So in the version of the union, we'll receive it, it has all that information, but for our other folks, um, it'll just be a simplified, obviously, version. And Ellen, Ellen tracks all of those. So we have internal documents where we're tracking where people are and when their hire dates were. It would be an HR thing. It is. Where where each individual is should be a part of the actual schedule itself. So. Exactly. Other questions? So each year that we look at this, basically the only change really in this is going to be is that everything is increased by say two and a half percent or whatever is decided. Oh. I mean, potentially, if, um, I mean, I'm sure, because next year will be a, a bargaining year with the union, and so there may be some areas where if the union feels that, um, that there's a position that is not classified at an appropriate pay level, that they're having that discussion during negotiations, and so I would expect the salary schedule would reflect any agreement that came out of those negotiations. Um, Lisa is constantly, 
every year we'll be checking these to see to make sure that they're in compliance with with pay equity so for the non-represented i think she'll probably continue to just check those and if something looks off um like way off would bring it to the court um but for the most part yeah it's probably just going to be for most of our folks um standard cola increases um, for the union folks, it'll just depend on how those negotiations go and if there's any um, positions that they raise concerns about during that process. Did we have any concerns from staff, um, either the clerk's, the clerk's office or the treasurer's office? Are they going to be able to work with? Well, that schedule is very useful to us for our purposes as long as there's something else applied on the issue. Because um, we do need to have to be in. An hourly rate. What so, step we're in, what step we started in, and part of that's in our files, but it's just nice to have a condensed document. So, in essence, what we would be doing is Ellen and Nathan and I would be basically having the administrative where all of those details are located that administratively we are updating. The issue I think that the auditors had was those administrative details are really not court decisions. So we can't go back on the CBA agreement. We've agreed that we're doing steps and this is the, and so what we, I think what the auditors are trying to have us avoid is have conversations about individual employees in this forum when we're talking about salaries. Because um, we're really setting the position Payments, not, not, about the, not, not the, the individual that's the working there. The position, so. yeah. So there'll still be that behind the scenes paperwork that we'll have to do, so that Ellen and Nathan have what they need to prepare the budget. And the, but yeah. for the court's purposes, it'll be the simplified version. Okay. Any more questions? I don't have any. All right, do we have a motion? We do. I move to adopt resolution number R2020-21 as presented. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt resolution number R2020-21 as presented. For further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye? Aye. <laughs> I was like, are you a no? Uh, any against? No. Motion carries. Okay, I wasn't sure which way you were going there, Leslie. I just don't know. <laughs> All right, so let's go in to announcements. Let me see what I've got here. So, the Planning Commission met last night and I think moved forward on the conditional use permit. So, I think um, we had talked about moving the county court meeting to the 22nd so that Michelle has enough time to prepare those documents and get everything noticed in the paper. And um, so we would do, be doing a uh, land use planning hearing on the conditional use permit, and then we have our regular meeting on the 22nd. One of the things um, to give everybody a heads up that we are talking about because of the mask use and the number of people that I think are probably just gonna wander into the courthouse and completely ignore that, um, is we are talking about closing the courthouse to uh, so that access is by appointment only um, so that we can control the flow of traffic a little bit more and have the expectation to get people who are coming from up for appointments will wear those and so what I'm looking at doing is putting our county court meetings at the memorial hall um, so that we don't have the building open and people wandering the halls and hopping from office to office without masks Give a better distance fee for the audience. Exactly. So we're talking to the city about whether that's available. So once we have those details um, nailed down, we'll let everybody know where the location is, but I'm thinking that's probably where it's going to be. Um, let me see, what else do we have coming up? Tri-County Court is tentatively scheduled for the 29th, and it, we are supposed to be hosting, but I'm going to send out an email and see if they still want to do that. Um, or if so, we would probably host it at the Memorial Hall because we have we would have nine then to try to accommodate. And I, we cannot do that in this room. Would you uh, consider going back to Zoom? Or? Potentially. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I something on the agenda. I would prefer the um, virtual as opposed to for Tri County. Yeah. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll toss that out and see if people want to meet over Zoom for Tri County. I don't know if there's going to be anything yeah. pending. What might be on the agenda? So um, I like that idea because that would make it a lot easier for me to um, attend. attend. Yeah. So I think we'll maybe suggest that and see um, see how that goes. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Those are the only pending meetings that I think we've got. Uh, Frontier Telling It, I should have mentioned earlier, did meet, passed their budget, and we did end up hiring a project manager to work on the Roosevelt and the Cottonwood site. So it is the same manager or one for you? The same manager. manager. Um, it's Ryan LeBlanc was the successful person. He used to be a day wireless guy and has come off on his own now. So he um, was the winning bid on that one. So that is progressing, which is good because Click Attack PUD has had major power issues and wrote the Roosevelt site goes down because we don't have a we don't have a generator. And so the 700 radios then don't work at the north end of the county while the power is out. Yeah. And that's happened probably a half dozen times in the last three months. And so uh, Gary's at his wit's end. And I said, so, um, we are trying to get that prioritized with Ryan so that that gets addressed yeah. as soon as possible. Other than that, I think that's all my announcements. Do you guys have anything? I have a couple. Um, I got this in the mail yesterday, and I was I thought it was really good. Um, oh, I haven't seen that. To get this information from our new um, Tri County Vet Police Service Officer. Oh, yeah. It went out to everyone. Great. So I thought that was really great. Um, also, Terry Tolliver, our North um, Central Public Health District Director, her last day as the director was yesterday. So I am sad to see her go. Um, but I'm sure she's probably still going to be around in some capacity. Um, I'm sure she will, but that, that happened yesterday. And then the last thing I have is um, we have an employee whose employment situation is under review in one of the departments, one of the departments that I was assigned. Um, and there's some uncertainty as to who has authority and who makes these decisions. So I've asked county legal counsel for a Okay. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, I think the only thing I have is um, NORCOR uh, board will meet on the 16th and we are still using Zoom. Okay. Uh, we are trying to stay out of the jail as much as possible. Anyone that doesn't need to be there. Okay. And it's working out. The stuff's been working out quite well. I think for the regional meetings, it makes a lot of sense. You don't have to drive to. It keeps us out of their environment. <laughs> Don't bring your germs in. Right. Jail. Exactly. Um, okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay. So for the 22nd, I'll, we'll get back to you on where that's going to be, but let's tentatively plan a memorial hall. Okay. They've confirmed. They've confirmed. Okay. okay. So we're doing it at Memorial Hall on the 22nd, and that'll be at 2 at 10. I would expect. That will be a long meeting because I think yeah. Sherry and I are going to have to do the because Leslie will um, be conflicted out on that one. So Sherry and I will likely probably spend at least I'm guessing the first 90 minutes at least, if not two hours, probably on the planning hearing itself. Um, so plan on going after lunch okay. as well. Um, all right, it's 11:39, and if we've got nothing else. I'll adjourn the meeting.